What's happening, ladies and gents? Welcome to another episode of the Ready for Anything podcast. Today, we're joined by Harry Shepard. This is a fantastic conversation. We dive into everything from military mindset, Harry's journey in service in the Royal Marine Commandos to where he is now, discipline, personal standards, and just some opinions and some controversial questions that made for a really, really good discussion. So as always, guys, please enjoy the episode. Please let us know, leave comments on YouTube, rate us on Spotify, subscribe on YouTube, but please enjoy the episode. Right now, I run a coaching business that helps people prepare primarily for the Royal Marines or the military. Uh, we kind of have clients across the board who do different things and just arduous events uh, around that. In terms of what's led me into that position, I think uh, we were speaking before we, we start to hit record. 2016, I joined the Royal Marines myself. I had various struggles with with preparing myself physically for, for for that process there wasn't too much out there in terms of information there wasn't too much out there in terms of resources to use and um because of that i think i, I struggled i was 18 i hadn't touched a barbell in, in my entire life and so i, I wasn't training very effectively and, and obviously looking back now i could have trained far far more efficiently and because of that, I struggled a little bit with the latter parts of training, which require a little bit more strength, require a little bit more kind of resilience. Uh, and so upon going through my career in the military, I sort of started to get an interest in coaching people training. I was coaching my mates just for free, just being, you know, they wanted to do marathons or whatever. I was, I was giving them some training and some some programs and taking, I'm sure you're familiar with like the troop phase sort of stuff, the, yeah. the squadron PT. So because I had an interest and a passion for it, I was elected for to, to take those those sessions it's got you know um some exposure some experience with that and then made the decision to try and go and do that full time because it was my sort of lived experience in the military versus what i was experiencing when i um coached people who were just my mates again as a hobby i was like well i enjoyed one more than the other and so obviously i've worked really hard to be where i was in the military and kind of got to that point through uh, a decent amount of effort and there was a very like a, a large amount of sunk cost attached to that um and and probably a little bit of like sentimental value as well but i had to make a little bit of a judgment call okay well day to day i enjoy one thing more than the other so let's make the other thing full time and so you again i'm sure you're familiar but you have a for people who are listening a 12 month notice period you have to give so you have to give 12 months and then you can leave 12 months after so during that 12 month period i got myself a kind of a job at a gym so I was like I really don't know how this fitness industry stuff works I've no idea what it looks like to become a PT do you pay rent on the gym floor do you be an employed PT who knows so I had to figure that out and I ended up being an employed PT on the weekends while I sort of transitioned out of the military um, during that time again I started to think about what I could niche down into or where my skills could be placed I guess you know you, you, you start to look at what you've achieved in the past you start to look at where where you've maybe struggled and overcome those struggles. So again, just to bring it full circle as to what I struggled with when I was joining, I was like, well, there's not really a, a market for that just yet. Uh, and so th thought I'd kind of dive into that a little bit on my own stuff online. And so I was doing that on the side. I was in-person PT and then when I left for um, for about a year to 18 months. Uh, and on the side of that was doing my online stuff, trying to build that up. And the intention was to build that up to a point where I could – transition into being online to have more locational freedom greater impact all that sort of stuff uh, and also just to have control over my schedule one of the things that like in the military was you don't have that you have zero autonomy over what you're doing day to day when you eat when you do fears when you like all that kind of stuff so one of the things i wanted from leaving was that level of freedom and i kind of got that a little bit when i was pt in but of course you still uh, the behest of a diary you know you still have to see clients at certain times and all that kind of stuff and obviously i was employed so i had the meetings to deal with as well so i was like well how can i internal conversation was going on in terms of how can i get into a position where i have control over my time obviously a self-employed coach of some some description comes into that so yeah i mean that's that's kind of the broad broad brush strokes where i kind of got to sell my online coaching stuff around two years ago just straight out of the 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 gym use the kind of experiences I'd, I'd had from a coaching perspective and I was super lucky to work at a, a really top quality gym around some really really experienced coaches so my year to 18 months which I was quite busy I was like 40 50 sessions a week which in person PT is quite it's quite heavy lot, um yeah so I mean and I was looking in, in terms of again I didn't have to market for my own clients 
they just give me my clients and I was like, just coach. And I was like, cool, I can do that. So um, yeah, super lucky. It was like a baptism of fire, but I was trying to be a sponge for everything I was exposed to. And then again, just uh, just transitioned out and started to navigate this online stuff, which we're both now doing. And uh, it's now going going pretty well, but it's been a, been a journey. Like this last, I'd say 12 months, my business now looks night and day different to what it did 12 months ago and so that and that's just a continual process of, of trying and iterating and just growing so hopefully that paints a little bit of a, of a picture i don't know I've no i mean that's that's it. perfect it gives me a bit of an insight as well to where you're at and i had this conversation with someone recently it's like whatever you think however hard you think it's going to be to start a business or pursue something new like times it by like five like that that's it and it's like whatever the anytime you go into like a new point and it's funny like when you're someone that's like chasing progress whatever that is like training modalities and business and life like you get to a point where you you want to reinvent it after a while as well then you have to go back to that like tearing it down to lift it all back up and i'm going through a bit of that i was mentioning it to you before but actually kind of reinventing their life like changing our complete lifestyle and that's going to bring so many challenges but I think that's like uh doing all this stuff like I, i definitely think the military taught me that man like i always remember like the being able to just show up and focus on a day at the time i always remember like um going through basic training i know ours is not quite as arduous and as long as you guys man still arduous mate, it's still, mate it's, still, it's still tough mate do you know what like i actually was talking to someone about this recently and it's only been recently that i've actually it, there's this big ego thing attached to it where you don't want to admit how hard something is when it's actually really hard and for me like at, like that was the first time i had experienced choosing hard like see actually choosing to be uncomfortable for consecutive months back to back and it was overwhelmingly hard because like yourself mate like i wasn't prepared i wasn't fit like I, i'm not saying that you weren't fit right but like i wasn't in the spot that i needed to be to be there the best possible spot and it was very very hard and i remember the mindset that i really adopted there i don't know if you've experienced this was just focusing on a day at a time because when you yeah. focused on like what you had to still do to then be at the thing it's so overwhelming and i've taken that into training for iron man i've taken that into my business i've taken that into you just focus on one foot in front of the other and it gets you by yeah 100 i um didn't know that this was a thing at the time but that's exactly what i did as well like i, I take that into everything i have done and, and do up, up until this point and it's daily daily actions or day, daily kind of checklist is what i do now obviously i wasn't kind of being that intentional or tactical around it when I was uh, when I was in training, so I was eighteen. But you're absolutely right. Royal Marines training is eight months. I think I shared something on this actually earlier in the week, but it's eight months long. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of tests. There's a lot of exercises. Again, as you'll know, to look at it as an eight month process, or even as like a four four week or entire week to to get through week twelve, week thirty, whatever, is is quite overwhelming because there's a lot to navigate and there's, there's a lot of uh, challenges to come. So you're getting often stressed out and think and, and worrying about things that are actually you know two months away, a month away, whatever, which actually doesn't give you anything. It just steals from you in terms of energy and bandwidth. Whereas if you can just focus on the day that you're on or the, the evolution that you're on, even even to chunk it down even further, it's actually incredibly manageable. You know, can you get through breakfast and the first lecture of the day? Okay, sweet. Well, what's next? You know, and trying trying to do that repeatedly gets you to where you need to be. And, and the same with with business now when you have struggles and challenges which i'm sure again you'll you'll experience when you try, start to now reinvent things and try and um i think move abroad and that sort of stuff like obviously the challenge is gonna is gonna uh start to manifest but if again you can just draw it back to what do we need to do what's the next right action what's the next right thing to do then that's that's the that's all you can almost do because all you can control is the short term uh action and then that hopefully if you if it's in the right direction will yield the, the result and the outcome you want it and if it's not then it will show you what you could be doing and then, then it's still productive so you know it's 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 it that's exactly what i what i would do and um and again i just didn't realize it at the time that was an actual method that people use um but it was just something that i fell into i think anyone who has success throughout that process or throughout any uh military preparation or military kind of um, basic training will use something along those lines in terms of chunking things down yeah yeah 100 percent, man and i think that's probably just D- discipline defined doesn't it like de- yeah. you've got to actually define what discipline is it's being able to just do do the work regardless of the outcome of whether it's going to be good bad right or wrong you just do it anyway and um, so yeah, yeah you mentioned before like obviously sunk cost for anyone that's obviously 
um, listening and the like, what what does Harry mean by sunk cost? Sunk cost is like where you're committed to something, you're given a lot of time and energy and focus, and it's like a big part. You're like, folk do the sunk cost fallacies, like in a relationship where you're not happy in a relationship, but five years have went past and you're like, well, it's been five years, I may as well just keep going and see how this thing works. And yeah, obviously, yeah. you mentioned that about the Royal Marines, that's something I wanted to come on and talk about. Obviously, you've seen opportunity. You mentioned there about you also felt like you were invested in it. It's obviously a big part of your life and identity still, you can tell me. Like, how was it leaving with that sort of emotional attachment to it? Yeah, so it's interesting. Like you say, it's uh, there is a, a tremendous amount of investment, time and energy that you put in to get to the position you're in. Uh, I think it helps the fact that you never are going to lose that. Like, you, you know, if you leave the military, leave the Marines, you still have being a, you, you still have that, like, achievement in the past and you can still kind of lean into that as, as, as whatever, whatever it is you need to do. I think for me, because I was becoming a slightly disenfranchised with my day to day, it wasn't incredibly like difficult or emotive to, to leave obviously in that, in that short, per, short period of time. So in the period of like leaving again, that 12, that 12 month uh, period, I busied myself and distracted myself with trying to set myself up for the next process next next period of my life uh, and so i didn't really think about it too much to, to be honest and and it was only actually when i left and got into a civilian role and sort of started to settle in a little bit and work within a civilian company that it started to be maybe a little more difficult to to navigate because again you, you would have you would have um, felt this as well the sets of standards that you I'm not i'm not talking about physical standards either professional standards that people hold in Civvy Street versus the the military is is very different. The 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 way you treat, you know, your colleagues or your your um your team members or whatever it is 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 completely different in the military because you'll 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 look out for them, you'll do anything for them, you'll you know, the last person will clean up before the the last coach would leave, and and that that's just what would happen in the, in the military. But I was expecting that to be mapped over into the the CV job I had, it just wasn't there, and so my expectations just weren't met with with those kinds of things, and that was a little bit difficult. And there was also a just one more kind of, I guess, thing to get used to was in the military, you're or in where I was, you go into work, and this, you overlook this because it's just happening day to day. You go to work with your friends, your your best mates every day, and you're just in there. It's like a big boys club. It's like a rugby club. You just go in. You do whatever work you've got to do. You've got, you know, you play sport and you go go for drinks afterwards or whatever, you know, whatever it is. It's a good environment. When you're on a PT solo on the gym floor, that's a really, really solo pursuit. You're just on your own and you're like, well, this is a little bit different, right? I'm having to now uh, go into work and yes, I'm talking to clients, but it's different people. It's different kind of conversations, different, different, different sort of context switching each, each time. So it's not the same. And there was a definitely an adjustment period for that. And for those, those couple of things in terms of standards and, uh, uh, and the social aspects, but I think from an actual occupational standpoint, it was it was actually okay. And I think that you know I almost disparaged the twelve month leaving period sometimes, but I think it, it's a good thing to give you that period of time to like bring your identity from one place to another. And I think uh, for whatever reason, I was I was okay at doing that. I was never like you know some people who join at sixteen spend. 15 years in the military, never go home, fully indoctrinated, fully institutionalized. Yeah. yeah. For them to leave, it's huge because it's like yeah. coming out of prison and going, you know, it's like, well, there's cars. What, what's, what's going on? So it's like, <laughs> uh, it's like short and redemption. But for, for me, because I'd already always kept one foot in, civ- in my civvy mates and my civvy life, like, it was a little bit easier, which again, I'm fortunate for me. It's not, it's not like that program. Yeah. I can, I can relate back to me. Like the one that I really noticed was, I remember that, that what you said there about standards and not just physical standards. I showed up to the, so I had done my, literally studied when I was in, left, done my PT course for like six weeks, done the six week one, then immediately just started working in the gym. I didn't really know like anything about, like see what you're saying, like just coaching and, and how it works. I didn't even follow any coaches, mate. Like believe it or not, no, like I didn't either. follow anyone. Like one of the first people I followed was Jay Alderton. And, uh, like, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, same. And then, yeah, so like I followed them and like, I was like, these guys are fucking legit, man. Like, I was like, you can do like a lot with like, like I was, they kind of showed me the sort of like the potential, but mm-hmm. I started off and I went to this gym. I didn't make, I kind of got hoaxed into running a business without even knowing that I was running a business. Like they were like, so you they were telling me my options and the options was basically 
you pay us, you do hours, and then you rent the. It was basically like a. They're not allowed to do it anymore because it's illegal. Because it's like you don't get any rights as a worker. Anyway, they were like that to me. They were like, but they they knew that from the way I turned up. But I actually turned up in a suit, right? I had a I had a folder with guys that I trained when I was in Cyprus and when I was in like UAE as well. Nice. I yeah. One afters. And the guy, like, I, Kieran, I remember, like, he was blown away, mate. Like, he was actually blown away by, like... You how... came pre prepared with yes. things. It's, like, prepared, straight right? Right? I came in prepared, yeah, yeah. right? And see, after that, mate, I would watch people come to do an interview. You know what it's like? It's like a fucking revolving door for PTs, man. Yeah. Someone fucking does chest day for three months, and like, I'll become a PT. And you're like, yeah, Jesus yeah, Christ, yeah. man. And I always remember, like, considering doing it in 2014 when I was deployed, and I was, like thinking about it because I was with this guy Mark and we just trained together he didn't really lift as much and he was like we got in really good shape and I was like yeah I could probably do this as like a career but then I was like nah I've not got enough like I don't have the stripes yet to do that man like I'm not ready and I was so astonished mate at like what folk was like because I seen it as a, a like I see I only ever was exposed to PTIs so like I was yeah. like they are you need to be the standard and I was like this is not the standard. Like this, this not is, reality. This is not <laughs> reality. And then yeah, yeah. the more I've done it, I'm like, God, man, there is people doing this that are like, I don't, I don't even know what they're doing. Like, and I, I get there needs to be a start point, man. But like, have a bit about you. Do you know what I mean? Like, a, you need to have a bit about yeah. you, don't you. It's not even that there's a gap in knowledge or, or whatever, which is you know fine. Like everyone can learn more. Okay, cool. But the, it, it's it is that personal standards. Thing. I think for me, I mentioned before, it was in a really, really good quality gym, which it was. The owner of that gym is, is a tremendously established trainer, been training for 30 years, whatever, trained all of the, the coaches himself and hold, held everyone to a really high standard. Like, that was why I was attracted to, to work there and and I think why they bought into my story as an ex-military and all that sort of stuff. But obviously there are people who maybe slip through the gaps who don't maybe hold themselves super accountable to the certain things that they're trying to uh, enforce as rules so you know just like simple things like pushing the client's pushing a sled and they're, they're faced away from you for 30 seconds and you get your phone out and start scrolling it's like what do you do like i like I don't, I don't understand it in terms of that person's paying you however much money for the hour you can press that down into that minute that you're then spending on, on your phone being freaking i don't know 80p or whatever but like that's their money that you're now pissing away but not not giving them the attention they deserve and i saw that far too much it wasn't just when they're facing away sometimes it's when they're on the leg extension they've got nothing to talk about they, they flick their phone out it's like honestly like it, it's it's crazy for that for for me and again that was at a gym where standards were held and and you know it was it everyone was employed and there was a, a set of kind of rules at like a, a pure gym or a, the gym group or whatever gym you want to you know you bracket into in terms of a commercial gym like where there's just a, almost a free-for-all yeah, the standards crazy. Like it's yeah, and it's not a knowledge thing. It's a it's a standards and a and an input and an intentionality thing. Yeah, I was talking about this to guys on the call on Monday, and I was like, "Be the standard, like be the standard for yourself." Like, because we were actually, I don't know if you seen the post I put up last week. We were in Spain for the retreat, and I was Spain so, yeah, yeah. in a Spanish gym, and they are notoriously dirty, like filthy, <laughs> man, like actually filthy. We're on the air runner. This thing's like coated. Like when I wiped it down, it had like it was like grime on it, man. But I was sweating and I was using it, and I was like, I wiped it down. And the yeah. Spanish woman who wasn't speaking English stopped the middle of the class and was like that to me. You are the first person in English. Like you are the first person that I have ever seen clean anything in here. <laughs> and I was just sitting there, you know, like, I can tell. <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah, but but like, see, for like, I, I took a moment and sat with it, Harry, and I was actually like, that she. How long has she worked here for? How many people has she seen? And she's actually stopped a class to say it. And I was like, God, it's actually never been so easy to be great. And I'm not saying that you're great because you clean things up, but like, it really is like you can you can just be. And I, and I, I was talking about this afterwards about how when I was in the gym starting out as a coach, that osmosis effect started affecting me, and I found myself doing things that I wouldn't usually do. So even though I would still hold myself to a high standard, that environment dictates and. That's got so much to speak for. And it's like, I was talking to my mate about this recently, Lewis, and we're basically just chatting about like, over the last few years, we, like we both have high standards for our health or fitness or training or potential or business, everything. And we've had similar mentors and coaches in our life and stuff. And it's like, 
I don't even need to be told sometimes, Harry, but see, if I know that someone is in my presence, whether they're on a virtual presence in the sense that I uphold myself to a higher standard because I'm like, well, I'm around this person that does it as well. Like your environment yeah. does it. Like it Abs- Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 100%. I think I talked to one of my friends, the guy I live with actually here, who's um, in the military himself. And we talk about it all the time in terms of environment dictating your sta- your standards. And I think for me, it becomes like the measuring stick that you measure yourself against. And you can use it both ways, right? In terms of if you're around, uh, I'm not going to name names, but in my, my, my social group from school, for example, obviously, you know, it's from school. So they've gone into whatever they've gone into and the physical standards maybe aren't there and they're not doing anything. So if I compare myself and my fitness routine to them, I'm going to be like, well, I train six days a week. I do that consistently. I'm a beast. Whereas if I go and then pivot and look at Ollie March on, for example, who's killing it, trains all the time, has a family, this kind of thing, trains more than me. I have none of those commitments. Then I can go, well, actually, I've got, I've got a fair bit of room to grow into here. Right. Yeah. And so it's all about actually just who you compare yourself to. And, and that measuring stick is super important because if you use the lower one, then just by virtue of looking at those people and, and comparing yourself to those, you're going to drop your standards. Yeah. Whereas if you just look up a little bit and you're like, well, actually, there's, there's a fair amount of, that I'm not doing that I could be doing better. There's yeah. a balance, of course, because that can disempower you, but I yeah. think that's just yeah. perspective. Yeah. Um, I think it, it's, as long as you view it through having a little bit of a growth mindset rather than being um, fixed and looking at a, a bit more like a jealousy where you're like, oh, fuck him, he's kind of, oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I guess about ten sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so if you know, if you're like, oh well he's on steroids or he's like whatever, he's super lucky, then then that can be unproductive. But I think, you know, if you're looking at it going, look, there's obviously he's in he's more busy than me and he's doing still more, then and that's just physical fitness. You can look at that from a business thing and, and mentors are a great example of that. Uh who obviously have more stress to deal with more whatever to deal with and they deal with it in better ways. And yeah. then you look at that and think, well, you know, maybe I can pro- probably emulate that a little bit. But yeah. I do think that the environment's huge and everyone says it, right. If you hang around with five fat people, you become the sick. Like it makes sense. And it is, it, it is, um, it is accurate, but I think people just don't leverage it as much as maybe they can do. Yeah. Um, and we gave a training on our group, group session actually a few, a few weeks ago about the same thing. Um, just try trying to, and again, if you can't curate your physical environment to the point where you want to, because maybe you don't want to cut off friends and all that kind of stuff, which I probably don't recommend. Um, it's, it certainly is an internal people pleaser. I don't think that's probably the wise, wise thing to do, but your digital environment is absolutely under your yeah. control. So who you follow and your digital diet of information is 100% under your steam. So if you go and follow a load of OnlyFans girls and like whatever whatever you want to do, just because it feels good in the moment, then of course your felt sense day to day is going to be a little bit different. So if you go and follow people who are super aspirational, super inspirational, doing all the things you want to do and, and, and giving you motivation, inspiration day to day. So I think that's just something to maybe look into if people aren't aware of it or thinking about it is just who do you, who do you follow and who do you have a day to day interaction with on, online? Cause people mm-hmm. spend an average of five hours a day on the phone like it's going to influence something, right? Yeah. So uh, I think that's important. Yeah, it's uh, it's mad how much you can do it as well. That I always say the the comment that folks say, it's, it's like a race to the bottom where they're like, at least I'm not the worst out of my friends. And I'm like, don't say that. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not have something bit, standards yeah. wise about. Yeah, yeah, like it's like, it's at least I'm not here or at least I'm not the unfittest or at least I'm not. And I'm like, I understand what you're doing, but that's a fail safe mechanism. And it's like, I had this conversation with the guys recently as well, one of our calls, and I was saying, like, if you want to win, you have to lose. And a lot of people are so, like, antagonistic about actually doing anything that involves any kind of risk of failure that they never actually experience what it's like to win. So everything becomes a game of participation. So, like, even when it comes to how they speak to themselves, like I said right there, it's like, well, at least I done this, right? And I'm not shitting in anyone's parade and saying that you shouldn't celebrate what you've done. Like today we were talking right before this, like I had an awful session and like it really wasn't good. Like it just didn't feel good. Like I was just talking about basically how I felt last few days and it's kind of 
replicating how I've done in the past and I'm, I'm being different this time, but I'm not sitting there praising myself going, well, at least I just done 15 minutes. Like I'm looking at it logically and I'm like, yeah, it was a crappy session and my heart rate was through the roof and do you know what? It was actually a smart step. I'm not pure sitting there like sugarcoating it. I'm just like being more black and white. And I, I think sometimes not being entirely honest with yourself is the thing that you then project. Like a question I said to someone recently was like, what, what do you, when do you experience self-doubt? And then they were basically talking about whether they experience it or com comparison. I went, do you think changing your views of that would change that experience? So if you're not as hard on that thing, like see that, that opinion that you have of something, do you think changing that opinion would do it? It's the exact same with us right now. Like that sort of being too kind to yourself all the time. Like when you're in like a season of growth or growing, like you kind of do need to be a bit harder on yourself. Like being too yeah. flexible is the thing that's actually making people unhappy. Like you need, like you need to earn flexibility. You know what I mean? Like see, like, Let's say, for example, you've got um, a guy or girl coming on board and it's literally you're giving them like the entry level stuff. It's like a 12 week prep or whatever. And it's like week one and it's like they've cut two sessions back and like I felt this way and I've done this. It's like, well, maybe week 16, mate. But like, let's just do the work. Yeah. Right? Like, let's just do you, the plan. Do you, know what I mean? you need a level of experience before you start to practice any auto regulation. You don't yes. know enough yet yeah. to start to pull back sessions or to go actually I'm too burnt out or actually I'm too sore. Well, you know, there's an element of like, this is the cost of doing business. This is the cost of yep. getting into shape. Like, there's a reason people are where they are, right? And that's the set of behaviors and habits and whatever they're doing right now. Yeah. And that's because they're existing in a comfort zone that they're not willing to break. And sometimes if they're, again, too easy on themselves throughout that, that initial part of the process, like whatever, first 12 weeks, if you're looking at a fitness journey, then that can keep them stuck and keep them in that position because they're always operating from that same operating system psychologically that they're, that they've always, always have them. And mm -hmm. it's only when they ignore some of those signals that they put, put, put on themselves. And again, that's like fatigue or, you know, this is maybe getting too hard or I'm pushing into a place where I've never been or whatever it is. That's where the growth happens because you know, we've all heard the, the Chad quote of it's, there's no growth in the comfort zone, but it, but it is true. And if you are just going to, recoil every time something gets a little bit tough and that's why i think people who've been through military training just to bring it back a little bit to that i think it's relevant is um ha have a certain way about them generally is because you don't have that option you know if you're going to get through military training you just have to be you just have to do it you know there's no there's no oh put your hand up and go oh well you know hamstrings a little bit sore this week can i can i just like go on the rower rather than run away there's none of that like you have to just do what you've got to do and i think there's an element of like that's a crucible people go through sometimes and spit out the other end with a certain set of values and, and, and identity that, that, that they then take take forward and i think that's maybe why if we again link it to business is, is you see a lot of ex-service people doing pretty well in business because I think they have that kind of dogged mindset that they're just like, well, this is a little bit uncomfortable, but we're going to try and push a little bit now. And again, I think it just comes down to, I think if people struggle with that and some people do, some people do, some people don't. I think if you haven't had that process, if we look at actually what, again, talking about the military um, process, what, what what is the denominator that's making people go through that? It's just accountability. That's all it is. Like some, someone, a PTI, whoever it is, as a system and they're going to hold you to it that's the only difference between that and and, and someone who's going going through a, a journey on their own so if someone hasn't got that level of accountability and i had to do it with business i'm sure you've had mentors like there's things you know you maybe should do but just don't do and the reason you don't do them is because they're uncomfortable and there's no one giving you that kick up the arse to go and do it go and do them so um it's that think, subconscious accountability that one we were saying about like i would say this to clients when they come into our program and it's like We've not even had their first like athletic performance call yet, or they've not even got their plan. They've not even done like a baseline session. It's like two days, and maybe we've taken folk on that are already training and walking the walk and stuff. And they maybe go and do a session, and I'll say, "How was? How's the last twenty four hours been?" And they're like, "I feel good right now because they've just like turned the dial up on intensity and everything. They've got a bit more purpose in them. Do you know what I mean like they're yeah, just, yeah, they've just bought into something like psychologically and physically that like they then just 100%. step up. Do you know what I mean? Um, which is great. Well. Yeah, I think like as soon as you make a commitment or as soon as you invest in something, of course, there's a level of impetus that brings with it. I think as well, I'm sure you do this with people, but setting like an intention or a goal 
whether it's 12 weeks or a medium term goal, something that I think you can do it in business, you can do it in work, you can do it in, in fitness, of course, but doing those, like setting that creates clarity in the, in, in the immediate term. So before you've got a goal or a direction, you, you know, all wins are fav- favorable when you haven't got a direction, you know, so they, yeah. they're going to, it doesn't matter where you go. And so there's no impetus to go and push into a specific direction. Whereas if I come on board with you and say, okay, in 12 weeks time, I want to do this at a high rocks. I want to hit sub 65 minutes. All of a sudden, 12 weeks out, I'm like, well, now I've got to do something in the immediate term to facilitate yeah. that, that outcome and that result. And and that's all that's all that is. And it just gives you a, le- a level of clarity. A lot of people are um, worried or, or I guess fearful of setting that intention because as soon as you define success, you also define failure. You know, mm. if you're if you're like, okay, cool, I want to do sixty five minutes. Well, if you don't do sixty five minutes, something's gone wrong, and you, you probably haven't, you know, yeah. adhered to the plan or whatever. And that's why people are sometimes pussyfoot around setting an actual specific goal and getting specific with things because there's a chance on the other end of that, there's a yeah. chance that it doesn't happen, right? So, yeah, yeah, I think that's interesting. Yeah, I think the the more you the more you take action, the more you embrace that, though, don't you? The more you normalize yeah. that as well over time. So, mate, no, that's uh, we went off and I had loads of different questions and stuff as well, but we <laughs> kind of went off on a, a few tangents here. Um, obviously, like, what was the sort of the highlight of your your service, mate? Your time in the moons. What was the sort of highlights? The top parts. What did you enjoy most? Any sort of specific points? Uh, it's a good question. I think probably some of the deployments or some of the the trips, of course, spring to mind because they're the the novel stimulus you know they're the things you don't really do a lot a whole lot of and so for me norway was was probably a a highlight you're going to do your arctic warfare training it's like again it's super novel and you're living out in norway for three months and you you go and skiing and doing all that sort of stuff and obviously there's a uh operational element as well um that was really cool and i think just the fact that you're gaining i guess skills in an area where you just would never have had any experience before and and also looking back on that like the uniqueness of that experience is insane. Like if you're not in the Marines or maybe some other parts of the military, like you're no, you won't experience that. Like it doesn't matter like if you go and do it as a civvy or it's not going to be the same getting taught how to cross country ski and all like all these random skills that I'll probably never use again, but like a, they're really cool and unique things to, to get to do. So that was probably one, I think that would, that sticks out just, um, we did like four months. We went, went just for, uh, it's called the winter warfare course which is horrendous, um, but learning how to operate in the, in the sub-zero temperatures, basically, uh, before Christmas. Then we went out for a, a three-month sort of deployment to, to Norway after after Christmas. But that was like a four-month block that was pretty good and stands out a little bit. Um, uh, and again, just because it's so different, so unique to mm-hmm. anything you ever do. You do loads of the, like, Salisbury Plain and those are, those are exercises, which are, which are great, but you know, they're all samey and so they blend into one. Whereas that I only did it once and, and that that was that was kind of cool. Yeah. Um, I always yeah. tried to jump on as many opportunities as I could when I was in the Air Force. I'd done the basic free fall parachuting course. I done the um exercise Vixen Eagle, which was the entry level to Nordic skiing done like Yeah yeah. It's cool man that mate see Nordic skiing, it caught me off guard, man. Like I was like <laughs> that is rough, rough isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, man. super rough. It's taxing physically and then uh it's also just like the skill element of it is insane. Yeah, the, we what they call it the skills, the skills underneath. Where you have to grip your yeah, feet. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's now I mean, we we have to do it. Uh, there's like a there's three weeks of that winter warfare course. There's a survival week where you just get to grips with things and you have to spend a night without any tents and all that sort of stuff. And then there's mobility week in the middle, which is where you get essentially skilled up on how to ski. You've done it a little bit, but you're doing a bit more of it. And then you have to do a series of like moves under load, and it's pretty heavy as well because yeah. the the kit in Norway because you have to carry so much stuff, like shovels and all the rest of it, and special kind of stoves and all rest all that sort of stuff and tents uh, is super heavy. And so you you under that massive load, which would be stinking if you were just walking, but now you've got to ski <laughs> and balance, and it's like what the <laughs> like is it's there's so much going on. And then when you fall over, so you've got it's like you're in a massive group snake if you can imagine just people dotted yeah. um down in one straight line like a queue almost up to this wherever you go into high point um and if you that snow that you're, you're kind of going over gets compacted and so you, you can kind of walk on you could walk on it if you wanted to uh and obviously the skis have a massive surface area which is why you use them that's why you don't sink through the snow it's super deep if you then fall over to the side 
that snow isn't the same. It's just just deep, powdery stuff. So you just disappear into like four to six feet of just deep snow and you can't get up. It's just a nightmare. Um, so it, it's, it's a cool experience, but it is tough. Uh, that certainly that first couple of weeks, because there's some serious marches and moves. You go like eight, eight plus hours and people are moving at like one, what 1.5 K an hour. And it's just, it's insane. So, yeah. um, yeah, so that, that was cool, but rough. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I agree as well in terms of the, uh, opportunity piece. I always, I probably did shy away a little bit and, that's probably one of my regrets. I don't know if that was one of your questions, but um, one of my regrets of of the service was just that when the opportunities come so fast and furious, sometimes you're like, well, this is going to be there forever. I don't need to jump on exactly. the yeah. Whereas, you know, if anyone's listening, who are is either in or is looking to go in. That's something I would definitely just try and Honest. leave wrong because, yeah, if if you can get as many of those opportunities, which are paid for and which are super unique and which are, you know different to whatever you're going to and people you know they say civvies pay thousands for whatever it is yeah, doing, but it's true yeah. um and for the most part they're going to be positive experiences so and certainly when you look back on them so a couple um, of guys yeah, I, be, I know done their um all their parachute and stuff like but mm-hmm. like all civilian qualification all like proper free fall like from height you went to california all paid for through the air force like all yeah, yeah. it's like, insane insane mate like absolutely mental how so, much if you say yes to stuff, yes, you're going to get some shit, which, okay, cool. You can probably deal with that. And it's probably going to be a good story and whatever. Uh, but also you're going to get some really, really good stuff as well, which, which again, you can't really uh, you can't really beat. And the military will look after you, certainly if you're in the Air Force. I will look after you on those things. Um, you've chose the right branch there. <laughs> uh, the, I remember uh, we got to Estonia once. Um, we didn't know where we were going, always kept in the dark. And we were with the RAF traveling. And we got off the plane they got onto a nice air conditioned coach and went to hotels. And then we were, we got on a four tonner, which is a troop carrying vehicle, yeah. big fucking green thing. And, uh, just got ferried to this battle camp. And I was like, what, what am I doing? I've chose the wrong, <laughs> chose yeah. the wrong regiment. Here. Mate, it's um, funny. Um, my client Ryan, he's in the Navy. Wait, well, he was in the Navy. Sorry. Um, and he always gives me stack as well for like, the hotel thing. And I was like, uh-huh. even, mate, the hotel thing is this chat, right? I have, I never stayed in a hotel. Never. <laughs> Once when I was in, like, mate, I went on when I done that parachute course. I stayed in the worst army barracks I've ever been to in my life. I probably would have been better off in a tent. Like, <laughs> that was it, mate. Did you ever go to some of those old, like, sort of uh, transit accommodation they called it? Yeah, like, you would go in, mate, you would open a cupboard and there would be like a porno mag from like fucking 1970 in it. And you were like, yeah, I've yeah, been yeah. in this room since like 1970. <laughs> I was like, holy, <laughs> the bed was wet. You were like, what the hell is this, man? Yeah, how's the bed wet after yeah. no one's used it for 10 years? Yeah, yeah. it's, it's uh, you stay, some, stay in some crazy places, but you, so you got the uh, the stigma of staying in hotels and never actually got the, oh, the benefit of it. That's, that's, sure. that's, that's no good. I did yeah, stay in some good. We stayed in it, mate. I tell you what, when I done that exercise Vix and Eagle, we stayed in a log cabin. It was amazing. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, cool. that's how you do. That's how you yeah. do Norway. Um, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we were in, to be fair, the, the accommodation in Norway actually was, was all yeah. right on the actual base, but uh, we were intense for the rest of it. So, um, yeah, that's not, not quite the same. Yeah, different, man. But, um, yeah. mate, some two controversial questions, man. And I was just like more just wondering about it. What's your thoughts on like national service? Good question. Uh, it depends, again, depends how you look at it because logistically it's probably insanely difficult to implement. To do. But, but from a, a kind of principle standpoint, I think it could be a good thing. I don't know whether you would say, okay, everyone's got to go and serve in the infantry. But I think just as like a an incentive for, if say, if say it's, it's a non-negotiable 18, you've got to do a year for whatever reason and, and you have to pass a certain amount of physical tests and that sort of thing. I think the downstream impact on society after that, after that year, whether you've got a little bit more discipline, whether you can now just be fucking punctual because people can't do that seemingly nowadays like that's that's a, a big skill it's like a big thing when i went to went for my interview for uh my job in the gym they were like oh but you're five minutes early i was like yeah well i know <laughs> like it's an interview uh, and like everyone's always late i was like oh, how like you get the time ahead of time anyway, but okay you get a little bit of discipline you get a little bit of um resilience maybe so you can deal with the challenges life's going to throw at you you might actually enjoy what you're going to do. And then we yeah. might get more people off the back end of that being in the military, which is it. We're super undermanned, which is, which would be good. So I think there's only positives 
if you were to act in the right way and if we could do it logistically. But uh, yeah, I, th- I think it's, it could be a good thing. I'm sure, you know, from like a fitness standpoint, of course, you know, so it's, it's a great thing. And there's, there's a stat in America, I don't know, I'm probably going to butcher this, but it's something like a, over a third of 18 to 24-year-old Americans were ineligible to join the military through, due to obesity. And that's just insane. That just isn't okay. <laughs> From like yeah. a, a defense standpoint, that's not that's not okay. But again, we were talking about standards earlier on. From a personal standards point of view, that's also just yeah. not not the one. So I think it could it could do a lot. It could do a lot to undo the damage that's been done by like the comfort crisis. I don't know if you've read that read that book. No, in terms of, so we it, it just kind of speaks to now we have everything at the the push of a button, immediate gratification in terms of dopamine or in terms of sitting on the sofa and ordering ordering food whatever it is, and how that's damaging to society i guess obviously there's a there's a health component but there's mental health is is, is an all-time low because of that probably as well and so i think it could do a lot to undo that uh, because so. it, it, it show you you know the yeah. opposite side of things i completely agree and um, what can i change why i've asked the question so it started last year. I went to Bali for a bit, and there was a lot of Russians there. Um, and I got really good okay. friends with a Russian guy that I'm still really good friends with. I still talk to him back and forth. And um, it kind of made not that I was pure anti Russia or anything like that at all, but <laughs> it made me realize that this guy is just like the fucking guy version of me in Russia. Do you know what I mean? They just like, just like, yeah. like, we had the same sense of humor, like, just really got along. He actually lived in America for a while, so his English was like American English. Like, he, he said, do the law, and it was Random. like. Yeah, 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 like yeah. whatever you pick up, like your your English, it's almost like you have that dialect and stuff. So he, he yeah, plays hockey. Anyway, but like we, he was talking about national service in Russia, and I was kind of like asking about it a bit more, and he was like, "Well, if you don't go, if you don't go to uni, you have to do national service." And I was kind of like, "That's a good rule, man. Like that's like I think yeah. that's a pretty good rule. Pretty like, reasonable." Yeah, I think, and, yeah, and I think I think as well. Like I, again, I'm not saying everyone needs to do it or like, but. I think to the point that you said, Harry, about like it does it instill some things, and I don't think it needs to be infantry basic training. Maybe just more of like a the school of hard knocks for like six months or something. Do you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't have to yeah. be like like pure fizz twice a day and stuff. Like it 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 could be just basic stuff. You know? But I think it would. Uh, I thought I'd ask you that question to hear your opinion on it because I think it'd be good. I don't think it, uh, maybe not North Korea good like twelve years. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, probably probably not. And obviously the flip side of that, you know, to play devil's advocate a little bit is. It- you know, logically, you would go, okay, well, now we're going to have a shitload more people in the military, which is great. But there's a, and this doesn't happen if you only implement a year, but if you implement like four years, you then get a subset of people in the military who don't want to be there. And that's, that's no good, idea. you know? Yeah. So that that is the the flip side. But again, if, if you're only doing a year and it's you can choose your branch almost, then that's probably, probably um, circumnavigates that issue a little bit. But yeah, I think it could do a lot. There, look, there are loads of things we probably need to change or should or should look at from like a, <laughs> yeah. a developmental perspective from the age of 12 onwards. Uh, national service could be definitely one of those. I think teaching freaking financial advice and business to people could also be advantageous. Me, I walked yeah, past um, the, the bus stop this morning when I was at a walk and it was just like 12 kids at the bus stop and they're all on the phone. <laughs> they're all just like yeah, staring yeah. at their phone like that. And how and old like, are they? I, I mean, they were like, like probably like 12. You know what I mean? like, right. and I was like thinking back to when I used to get the bus to school and I was like everyone used to speak everyone used to speak to each other <laughs> like, Mad that, isn't it? I know. Well, they, we're, we're bad for that anyway in this country I think and certainly if you go to London where about you based? I'm uh, west, west of Glasgow mate so just like out, oh, okay. out in a town yeah cool so if you're like a city centre London's the worst example of this but you can walk you could quite easily walk and get on the tube all day and not speak to anyone because everyone's on their own, everyone's in their own little London world, you know. Everyone's like reading the paper or on their phone or whatever they're doing, but they 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 head down, they ignore you. Um, I went to Nashville, Tennessee earlier this year. The opposite of that. So that's also a big city, Nashville. But everyone speaks to you. Everyone's super nice. Got loads of time for you. Like that southern hospitality thing is a real thing. Yeah. Um, and I think, like again, like just culturally, we're predisposed to be a little bit more. In, insular I think certainly in America if we compare it to over there yeah. uh, and so the introduction of like phones at such a young age just it compounds that massively because now yeah. you're not even getting that ability from 10 to 13 to socialise yeah which is right. insane 
we were having this conversation the other day because we were in that gym and I was like, fuck man, everyone just lets it hang out in here, man. Like when I was in the gym and I was like, that's not, everyone's like, not that I'm saying that needs to be a thing, but the girls were talking about <laughs> it as well. The girls were like, I've never been in a changing lot. Like that the girls are just letting everything hang out, man. And I was like, well, it's probably to do the fact that like we are so reclusive in the UK. Like yeah, so with everything. Everything, man. Everything like phones, nudity, like everything, man. Yeah. Yeah, Interesting yeah. fact. Comedy to a set to a point. Yeah, there's a there's a this only one of the only nude beaches in the UK is near here. Like it's fucking oh, really? really random, man. Like we went a walk down it one day, and there's always just like really overweight naked guys just walking on it, man. Me and Ailey walked yeah. down, and we we're like, it always confuses me that because yeah. surely nudity, uh, being a nudist, you'd want to show off your wares, right? And, and yeah. why I don't get that if you're. <laughs> chronically out of shape but anyway whatever. He, he was um, walking it was funny because he was walking with a sausage dog I thought that was hilarious man he got a sausage dog next <laughs> yeah to that's fantastic yeah that's good but, that's great yeah um, but, um, no it's definitely like I, I can agree mate I thought I'd ask you that question and secondly mate other controversial mm-hmm. question what's your thoughts on like women and obviously you can only really comment this and like the Royal Marines I know you coach some people and but like women in frontline duties like what's your sort of verdict on that again another interesting one i don't think i can give a yes or no answer unfortunately uh but i think there are, there are benefits and there are drawbacks as everything so i think the the benefits of course are now you're going to open up to a, another 50 percent of the population the marines are understaffed so is the rest of the military so cool that's a great thing uh you also you know the obvious one of giving women equal rights and equal opportunities cool that's that's also really good and probably good for society and good for uh, just um i think women and men that give everyone that, that opportunity i think it makes it slightly more competitive i think as long as the standards are, uh, remain the same across the board be it soldiering or physical then again fine um the u.s marines have done something where they've dropped the standards for the females and that's not that's not okay you know they have to carry the same stuff they have to be able to achieve the same thing when it actually comes to it so you should be able to do it um, in 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 training and, and as as a as a standard, so I think as long as that's upheld, then it's probably not not going to be a negative. The only other thing is that it would change the dynamic a little bit in terms of certain of the Marines. It's it is a boys' club and it is something that's like you know there's a certain way things happen. There's a certain band to everyone lives together everyone you know showers together all those kinds of things which all pay into whether it's trivial or not all pay into the the camaraderie in the group and so whether it would disrupt any of that of course you wouldn't know until it actually happened and, and was getting trialed and tested and, it's not uh, happened yet has it there's not i don't think there's not really i think there was no, one there's, bit, there's, there's one been one one female who's passed the all arms commando course yeah, no one's been, yeah no one's gone through conventional uh channels yet uh but yeah, again, it's difficult. I, I don't think it would be a drawback, to be honest, as no. long as there were the same standards. I admit that, I've, again, I always remember, like, it's not that I've got a yes or no answer to it either, but, like, I think it's just change, isn't it? There's going to be, a, when you instigate change, I think if there's a fucking savage woman that can carry her own and absolutely kill it and crush it, it would be very inspiring. Like, I think that would yeah. actually probably be more of a... Um, I get what you mean there about the change in sort of culture and stuff, as well. that's a big one. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. The one that I... I don't know if this has changed now, but... I wasn't, our role wasn't like a soldiering role. I was a aerospace systems operator. Although you do like a basic soldiering and some of the guys and girls in our trade had done all arms commando or they'd done because they'd been attached to a more frontline role responsibility. Depending yeah. on, like, Cause some of the, we used to work with, uh, I think it was nine parachute regiment. I think it was. And we, cause we managed like the giraffe radar and stuff like, so you were, you had more responsibility like that, like that but in non frontline roles, the guy and girl fitness standard is offset, but in frontline roles, it's the same. How does that make sense? Like, yeah, it does. Yeah, it doesn't. Um, that makes sense. Again, it, it's it's just to that's just to lower the bar, lower the barrier uh, of entry to get get in. I think, and and because you know, there's probably a a bigger benefit that having a fe- having a female perspective or a, a female kind of brain because they do work differently. In something that is non-combative can probably can probably bring, uh, yeah. What I would say there's regard people always like talk like this is going to be you know if we let it let it happen then it's going to be you know 
millions of females in, in the in the Marines t- tomorrow. It ain't going to be the case. There's maybe going to be one. She's going to be a monster, right? It doesn't, like, it's not, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, if Tia Claire Toomey wants to join the Marines, then fine. Um, yeah, they're the best but, fucking but, Marine ever, man. <laughs> well, exactly, yeah. So, I mean, people talk like, oh, you know, females could never do what, but it's, it's just not true, you know? Like, get nine or ten Royal Marines commandos next to a Tia Claire Toomey or someone, whoever, put like Ronda Rousey or put a, a female athlete in there and she'll wipe the floor with all of them. So, it's... You know, it's not necessarily that there's going to be a thousand women in the Marines tomorrow. If you if you go and allow that to happen, uh, there's going to be a few, and that's that's fine. I, I don't think that's going to make a massive massive difference. I had um, Sean Conway, the uh, guy that done the 105 Ironman in 105 days on the podcast. Oh yeah, I heard about that. Yeah. yeah, crazy and uh, mad. But he was basically made a really good point. He said he doesn't think endurance sport has been capitalised yet because it's not been glamorised enough. Like. Um, he says it's, he doesn't think it's reached its potential because the people who do it really well end up being there's obviously like top tier athletes, but he's like they haven't like because you kind of need to surrender to that as a total lifestyle. Like it's like you need if you want to be an ultimate endurance athlete, you need to be doing like twenty five thirty hours every week. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, it's a full time like, job, full time job. That's what you do all the time. And uh, he was saying that he doesn't believe that endurance sport has been captured. He doesn't think it's like the potential because he didn't start exercising until he was 28. Yeah. That's you know crazy. I mean? like, and, he, and he's like this like yeah. done insane thing. So he was saying if you took someone that's like a top level person and took them into that, and he was talking about a Tour de France athlete that's actually re- recently done that, and they're just like setting all these mad endurance records because they're doing it. And I think it's the same in like this. It's like there will be plenty of women out there that could fucking crush it and do it, but do they want to do it? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe part of the reason is they, you know, they look at it and go, well, you're going to go and do this much work to get paid. What? Like, it, it seems to work. It doesn't seem to work for me. So I'm going to go do something else. Maybe that's part of it. Like, the, the, there just might not be the appetite in most females for that. And of course, there is for a, like a small percentage of women, they might want to go in and do that. And that's great. And again, like, it's a small percentage of men. People forget this as well. Like yeah. it's not like all men can go and do it. It's not like it's not like a man or woman thing. It's a capability thing, and that's yeah. that's across the board. Like the military, the a great example of what a meritocracy would look like. Whether you're black, white, gay, lesbian, doesn't matter. In the military, you, if you can do the job and you're good at what you do, then you're accepted, which is fantastic. And I think that that is this that would happen as well for this for this gender difference. Like if you can do the job and you're good at it. Then you know, why, like, why not? And that, that's uh, that's something that I think people again just forget that, that they think that all men are capable of joining the Marines. It's not the case. Like, ninety nine percent aren't, and ninety nine percent of women also aren't. You know, <laughs> but um, it, it's a small percentage. That's what I love about doing like different challenges and events and things because you stand there on the start line and you can't be there if you don't do the work to get there. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's it. Like- events like certainly you can go and do a half marathon and you can not train for it and you can have the worst two and a half hours of your life do you know what I mean but like there is certain events like ultra endurance events like trail runs like mountain events like Ironman like extreme triathlons like that's what I love about them because they're almost like that sort of like it's, I always say they're like an adventure on a quest man because like you get this like badge of honour at the end of it that like you you know yeah. you've done the work to be there and um, I think that's why I probably like them so much after leaving the military because it's like it's like your berry, isn't it? Or it's like your cat badge, or like it's like mm-hmm. it's like you're like, oh, I've earned that. Do you know what I mean like that's like yeah, yeah. like yeah. Uh, it's de- it's like you get this representative thing that means that you've done the work to be there, man. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, go sorry, on. what were you going to say, mate? I was just going to dive. On. I was, I was just, just to say it's a it's a representation of the not only that like couple hours that you've done the actual work either. It's like the twelve weeks you've spent prepping for it, all of the decisions that you've made, like to train in the morning or to, you know, whatever it is that, that or the hard decisions that you've gone and, and taken to get to that point. Uh, and that little medal or whatever it is you get is, is a representation of all of those things. And that's why it should be pride of place because it's, it's something that you can look at and, and go, actually that proves that I am a certain type of individual rather than the, you know, the other type, whatever, who takes the easy, easy option. Yeah. hundred percent. So at the start, before we were hit record, and then we kind of touched base on it again, we spoke about disciplines, we spoke about that sort of day-to-day thinking, brick-by-brick thinking. 
What would you? What advice would you? And this is for anyone. It's not even anyone going for the military or anything at all. So obviously, the nature of people going for P Company, like Royal Marine Commandos, like it's fucking hard. <laughs> like it requires a lot of discipline. What yeah. What advice would you give to someone that's maybe going through that process right now that keeps breaking trust with themselves? It's really struggling to get that part of actually committing to it. What advice would you give them? First of all, realize that it's difficult and it's difficult for a reason. Uh, I think if you can continually remind yourself when something gets hard, that the like remind yourself of the gravity of the situation. You know, like if you if you're trying to achieve something that is again the top point one percent of people do. There are going to be t- times and there are going to be days where you don't want to do it, where you, you feel shit, whether you you know you perform badly. So have that as a managed expectation, first of all. Because if you don't and that's something that pops up out of nowhere, that can derail you and that's something that, that can happen. So that's the first thing. The second thing is just to start super small. So wherever, wherever you're at right now, again, we talked about comparison earlier on. If you look at whoever it is and they're doing something that you're not doing or maybe they're 10x in what you're doing, then that can, again, just be really intimidating and you, you don't really want to uh, set off on that journey but if you just bring it back down to its component parts and say what again like we talked about, what's the next thing but what's the easy step now in the right direction uh, then you know I almost look at it like, uh, like following a bearing if you think about it like navigation uh, if anyone's ever followed a bearing like to, to a point if you go on that exact bearing you're going to be good to go if you go a degree less and you you know go for 10 miles you're going to be way way in a different position and so it it speaks to the the idea of one like slight deviation in your action or in your behavior or in your choices can bring you out downstream at a really 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 different position and that's just kind of compound interest or the way anything compounds but you've got to look at the the power of that tiny decision as actually being the spark or whatever whatever it is you're 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 going to go and do and um so I think if you can bring it back to the the smallest action that you can take and um, that you can manage to like fathom, then then that's that's fantastic. And if you can go and do that yourself, then great. I think the final thing, and um, this isn't a plug, but like if you are if you are struggling to go and action those things we spoke about again before, making a commitment, making an investment into something, doing something like that, is is a powerful piece because. There is, again, we spoke about sunk cost. There is an element of sunk cost. And this isn't just financial, it's effort and it's everything else. But if we just take financial, how many people, if they've paid 20 quid for a gym membership, are likely to go to that gym on a regular basis? It's not too many. If you've paid £120 for a gym membership per month, you're probably going to be more likely to go and use it because it's you can see it coming out of your bank account every, every, every month. You're like, I should probably go and use that shit. Uh, and so like, there, there, are, there are more things you can do in terms of like, implementing accountability and implementing uh, a disciplined structured routine but those are a few i think just expect it to be as challenge as it is going to be expect the challenges um again get help if you need it and uh and make some sort of commitment and and again that those those kind of like 75 hard things you know that 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 yeah. challenge you familiar with that yeah so i mean it's, it's cool it's it's a good uh it's a good structure but i think probably too much for a lot of people you could implement a similar thing where you say, okay, for X amount of days, I want to be this consistent. I'll do this X, Y, Z every day and list yourself out some non-negotiables that are going to be manageable for you. Uh, that you can then again, keep that promise to yourself every single day uh, for 60 days, 90 days, whatever. And all of a sudden it just becomes a habit um, and it starts to become easier. That's there. There are a couple, I think that. Yeah. The, the, one, going the point you made there about the, the, the point you made there about the 75 hard one was really good, Harry, because I think, some people start too hard. Like they start like it's too intense and they're like, what do you do? And it's like, it's not what I do. It's like, what what are you trying to achieve? Do you know what I mean? Like, what is it you're trying to achieve here? And I, I was, um, our sort of mentality and mantra inside of the program is like, do what you said you would do. Because I'd done uh, a triathlon a couple of years ago. It was really, really tough. And I knew it was going to be really, really hard. I knew it was going to be like, it started right through in winter. So it was like, I'm going to be on my bike outside. It's going to be cold. I'm going to have to do like pool swims and I don't want to do it. I don't like swimming and stuff. And it was like, I got a, an ice bath and it was like around the time when it was big. But when I really bought into doing it, I was like, I'm just going to do this every day because if I can do this every day during this entire prep, it's going to be one additional string to my bow that I didn't have that's going to make me even tougher. Like, so see when like, I'm waking up, I'm heading out, I run in the morning, it's cold outside and I'm like, 
I'm already going to be cold. Why am I choosing to get cold before I'm going to be cold? Do you know what I mean? And like mm -hmm. that sort of like that that mindset of do what you said you would do was something that actually became so empowering for me because it was like, it's that full thing of winning the first battle. I wasn't in there letting my ice craft go, yes, I won it. I won the battle today. But like, that was the kind of feeling that I had. It was this like feeling of like, you've done it anyway. Like you, you still done it. You didn't want to yeah. do it, but you done it. Cool. That's that first one knocked off there. Cool. That next thing yeah. you're going to do is going to be way less fucking hard now. But that can be five minutes of mobility in your living room in a warm, cozy living room. But you don't want to do five minutes of mobility, but you do five minutes of mobility every day. And that's what folk don't sometimes see the value in. They don't see value in like, right, let's get your phone away at 9 p.m. and let's do five minutes of mobility in the morning. And they're like, what? I'm not fucking doing yeah. that. And you're simple, like, simple, easy stuff. changes. Yeah. But si simple isn't always easy. And like, there's, there's a difference between uh, what, what is simple and what is what is actually easy because it can be simple and, re and really tough to implement. Um, But what you said there about the ice bath stuff, people like to give it shit and give it shade, the ice bath habit. Because influencers have ruined it, basically. But you know, there's a there's a, an argument to make, and this is actually like something. Actually, I heard Andrew Huberman talking about it a few months ago. But essentially, it's a real psychological shift in if you can commit to doing something difficult. So just like you would like build muscle in terms of you're going to stress it and it's going to come back stronger. That's basics. Uh, you know, if you're if you're wanting to increase willpower or discipline or whatever word you want to use for it, there's the same process happen. If you go and do something difficult that you genuinely don't want to do, every time you do that, it starts to reinforce and starts to lay the, lay the groundwork and, and lay that layer of paint every time that over, over a course of however long that, that kind of prep was for yourself or, or, or anyone else, um, that your mental willpower is going to get stronger because you're practicing that every day. And that can be, like you say, anything but it has to be something that you genuinely don't want to do and the reason an ice bath is so good is because it's never something you want to do yeah. <laughs> regardless yeah. like it, yeah. it, it's one of those things that is always true to that yeah. people like to say oh well yeah well i train every day so i do something hard every day but some people love to train so it doesn't really fall into that category yeah. some people love to go to the gym it's not like a, it's not a thing you're having to actually drive yourself to do um so i mean yes yeah, so that's a it's an actual thing that it's not just bro science anymore yeah. like it's something that like, is, yeah. is an actual thing that if you get, go and do something tough every morning or every day then that does reinforce things and it plays into the identi identity like you say of someone who does what they say they're going to do yeah um and practices what they preach and and one of one of our questions on our check-in forms for the for the clients is have you kept the promises you made yourself this week and for that exact reason because you have yeah. to look look yourself in the eye every every week and go well did i or didn't i and, and that's a very cut and dry question uh, and, off, and the more weeks you can stack on top of, them, top of themselves the way you did, you're going to be in a, in a far better place. Yeah, it's your evidence, isn't it? Your undeniable stack yeah. of evidence. Um, but yeah, yeah. The, I always remember as well, like, it's funny how, like, I always call it comfortably uncomfortable. And um, mm -hmm. the last guy I had in the podcast, Ryan, spoke about this. And we're basically saying that, like, what well, you hit the nail on the head there, Harry, with, like, training, like, some for who we are, but I'm doing that hard thing. It's like, yeah, but, like that's like well within the confines of what you know like you've been like it's not saying that you're not pushing yourself hard and you're not like improving your fitness but like you become comfortable with it and it's funny that see what you said there about the ice baths are never nice but there was days where i still done it but there was days where i actually started to manipulate in a way that like i can still tick the box where i would do it midday after my run which was way less mm. intense than first thing in the day and I yeah. actually started finding myself cutting corners with the discomfort. And I see people do this through marathon preps where I start to see the run times and I'm like, why are they doing it at like eight o'clock at night now? But they've actually, they went from being a morning trainer to like, because they're just pushing it back, pushing it back, pushing it back. And it's like, it's funny because like I had this discussion with someone recently on paper, you can still be doing the things, but you know when you're doing it wrong. But you can actually go, yeah, hit my training, hit my macros, done this, it's like, why are you not getting results? And then you actually take a further look and it's like, mate, you fucking pushed that back there and you never done this yeah. and you went into that with a bad mindset and it's like, but people sometimes tell themselves that they're doing all of the things but they're just not being entirely honest with themselves. So it goes back to that question, like, did you make the, did you commit to the promises? Because you can say you did, but there's a difference between actually committing to them and, and just saying that you did, do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's the how as well as the what. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not just what you do, it's how you do it and how that manifests. Like you say, like if you're gonna go and do a 
10 mile run it's easier to probably do that midday when you're well fed and when you kind of can would g yourself up to go and do it whereas if you've got to compress it into a 5 till 7 a.m block and you could just got to go and do it then that's that's a little bit more difficult and that there is an um, ice bath is definitely a good example of that you can get in, get in after a sauna in a nice like nice nice environment that's that's easy um you know you probably stay in there for a little bit longer if you wake up and i'm the same i used to do this um it was like during covid and i need to give myself some purpose it was like i did the same thing i did three minutes every day for like i don't know six months or something i didn't miss a day but i was doing the same thing where i'll be like some days i'll go i'll just do two minutes today i just do you know just do two and a half minutes or whatever um and you start to let yourself off the hook and that's the thing you know if you can be as hard on yourself as as is productive then then that's where the the real growth is going to be going to be hard i think Mm -hmm. um but yeah, yeah, the ice bath's an interesting one because everyone obviously talks about it as a as a really trite thing, but it, it's a it's a powerful tool if you use it properly. Yeah, it definitely is, man. Um the last question that I have for you, mate, just before we round things off, because I'm very aware of time as well, is you've obviously mm-hmm. like this is the first time like I've obviously ever spoken to you in person. We obviously spoke back and forward. You've obviously got quite a, a good profile on site online. You've got like 39,000 followers, mate. You've got like great engagement and stuff that you've worked hard for, mate, and rightly so. What would, uh, for someone that's been following you for a good amount of time, what would someone not know about you through following you? What's something like that they might not know about you that'd be quite interesting just to round things off? Mm, interesting question. I don't know. Uh, there's always a, so I'll, I'll go I'll go, th- go through this, I think. So there's, there's always a probably, again, decent following, you only share things that you want to share, right? You know, like the, the physical... You're under the good lighting when you're doing whatever and you post the workouts you want to post and all this kind of stuff. And it probably looks, and it, this is true of everyone who you follow, well, just everyone. Um, I'm still winging it. You know, like you can look and go, it's got everything squared, got a great business, got great this and that, whatever. Like the amount of the day where I don't know what I'm doing is huge, you know? So, like to look into my, again, from socials and because you can create this narrative that you're, yeah, yeah. you know, all over it uh and again only share the stuff share the wins of or whatever like there are there's the challenges i have day to day that i don't know how to navigate and there are things that i go th- like I get, it's typically business stuff fitness stuff as well but you know I'm, I'm just guessing half the time and just seeing what works seeing what doesn't and then just, just trying to go from there and i think every uh, again this isn't just me but this then this is it's probably why it's a, it's a maybe a good point but everyone who you follow who you think has it squared just doesn't and the quote of everyone's wing in it could not be more true when you you know the, the higher you get in terms of uh you know rooms you get into to people who, who you see are influential or whatever uh you, you just start to realize this like it's idiots all the way up and <laughs> like everyone is 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 kind of uh figuring out as they go along then that that's probably maybe something that you wouldn't ascertain if you were just to face value look at the the instagram or look at whatever whatever you could look at that I'll put out there intentionally to, to look, to create a certain, a certain uh, picture. But yeah, I mean, and this, this again, like to just go all the way back full circle to the military stuff, going through training, you look at your training team and you think these are gods amongst men. These are people who can't do any wrong and you know, they fit as anything. And then actually you get into a troop and they, these are now just like your peers or your, your colleagues. And it's like, well, actually they're just normal, normal blokes. Like there wasn't that much crazy different about them after all. And it's an interesting thing. It's just perspective and it's just a, a, a way of maybe viewing things. I still fall foul of it now. Like I still look at someone else and uh, and think, you know, he must have whatever or they must have whatever. Uh, but actually most people are <laughs> just yeah. just figuring out as they go, you know, yeah. uh, and that's, that's I'm no different to that. Yeah. What's the story? The, the story is you shouldn't, the saying is you shouldn't meet your heroes. Yeah, true. Because yeah. Like, yeah. People true. meet that person they're, they're like, oh, wait a minute. They're just a person. Yeah, it'll demystify it. That can be useful, I think, sometimes. Though, you know, they they say that as you shouldn't because it'll de it'll get rid of some of the magic. But for some, for for me anyway, like that would inspire me to be like, okay, well, that's what that's possible then, right? You know, that, yeah. I'm the same. So, one of the first people I follow in the industry, James Smith, probably actually one of the main reasons as to why I do what I do now because showed that I don't know, just talking about the constructing a life or, or whatever it may be don't want to get too much into that but like he um i met him the other, the other week at ifs met him last year at ifs as well and like again you just realize 
just a just a bloke in his mid thirties doing his best, you know, like yeah. he, yes, he's doing really, really well and his business is cranking and whatever, but actually he's just uh, making it up as he goes along a little bit more uh, and he's probably just a little bit further along the trajectory than, than maybe anyone else is. So, yeah, um, yeah that's probably the, the, the one yeah. I would say. I think a lot of folk will like to hear that, mate. It's, I always say on our call <laughs> sometimes, like it's not in a sadistic way, but people like to hear other people's struggles, man, because yeah. Instagram is the highlight reel, isn't it, where... You don't really see it, um, don't really get it, man. And it's one thing I've always done is I'm always very honest about like where I'm going through and probably sometimes too honest to my detriment because then I end up actually being like, is no one else struggling with this? Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, but they are, they are. And like people just aren't yeah. honest about it. And I think it goes back to that. You ever seen that Eminem uh, thing? It was Gary Vee done it. And it was like Eminem and 8 Mile is like slating himself. So when it comes to the rap battle, no one else can slate him because he's literally put it all out there and told everyone his flaws. And I yeah. think when you're so hidden about your agenda, it can end up crippling you. Like I, I said this to Ailey recently, like about there's people that I look at and they're maybe big influencers, not in like the coaching world. And I'm like, that must be exhausting. Like that must be having to keep that image up all the time. It must be fucking mm. exhausting. It must be so tiring. It must be so depleting because I'm quite a high-performing guy and I've got a lot of responsibility and a lot on. And I'm like, I don't even fucking feel that good all the time. Like, I, I'm, I don't like, and it's like, but that's persona someone's pushing. But then think about it though, Harry, like our, our job is still fitness. At the end of the day, we can be this mindset guy. We can be this content creator. We can be this marketer. But it all strings back to, are you getting your client's results? And are, are you got your arm around that, that client? And I'm like, yeah, I'm good at that. But as I look at some of these influences, I'm like, you don't have that. Yeah, hundred percent. It must be super. Di- I always think about that in terms of you see the again, like whoever you want to choose in terms of influencer who don't really maybe have, say, a product or a business or whatever, something a service, and they just are validation, like, a, an ad, like an advertisement, basically. Yeah. Uh, and that must be stressful, right? Because there's nothing really underlying there. I have a mate who's a, a YouTuber, and his his sole thing is football skills. Uh, he's got like two million follow- like subscribers, doing incredibly well, right? But he's constantly stressed that it's all just going to fall off a cliff because he's got yeah. no sub- substance behind it. Yeah. It's all views. So if his next video doesn't go bang or doesn't do whatever, then he's he's got no nothing coming in. Obviously, there's com- stuff coming in from his other videos, but that'll eventually go. So if he falls off from a, like a virality perspective, there's no there's nothing coming in. He's got no service yeah. to sell people into on the back end or. You know, it's, it's, it must be stressful. And again, like you know, to link it back to what I was saying, like you can't look at someone on face value and just say they must be doing well because they've got X, Y, and Z. You've got to take the whole package, put it on wholesale, and be like, actually, what are they dealing with on you know from like an insecurity point of view or from a yeah. um, instability financially point of view or whatever. Uh, and like you say, you can always link back to that. Okay, well, I'm a coach, so that's fine. <laughs> as long as I can yeah. get results, I'll be all right. Um, and worst thing, but worst thing comes, I'll just go on the gym floor and uh, and be be that coach again that is yeah. working eight hours a day. That's fine. Yeah, no, I, I know it's it, it must be though. It must be fucking tiring, man, doing that. But I I think like we we are trying we're planning the great escape, man, to get away from social media eventually. <laughs> like is it? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like down the line, mate. I can't like I love social media and it's been the vehicle to get me everything, man. But like I was like, how long do you really keep doing it for? Do you know what I mean like you? you yeah. Do, like you. Like, am I going to be doing this when I'm 40? Do you know what I mean? Who knows? Will it be different? Will I still be using my channel? What will it be like? Will it be, I don't know, just something food for thought, man. Like, I'm like, how will things yeah. change? Because I look at some businesses, mate, that are like, like a really good uh, friend of mine, he was actually my mentor. Like, he's a um, really successful guy and he was basically, he's got a place out in Spain and the place that he lives in in Spain is like just full of millionaires and like really successful people. And they're like, none of them use Instagram, mate. <laughs> Like, and I'm like, right, what do I need to do, man? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, you run your yeah. business off Instagram, and it's like, but that's our world. Do you know what I mean? It's what we know. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, it, it's the lowest cost of entry as well. That's why, you know, if you're looking at getting into coaching or looking to market your services, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, all free uh, and fairly simple and easy to build a, a fault. Not easy, but like easier than any, anything else. Like, an email list is quite hard to cultivate, it's yeah, quite yeah. hard to get, get people onto. Uh, Again, it diversifies things a little bit. YouTube, super difficult. It takes a load of effort. It takes some investment. It takes, you know, you've got to buy a camera. You've got to, you know, edit things and all that kind of stuff, which is probably a, it's a better audience. It's a more bought-in audience. 
but it's tough to 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 execute and but instagram 60 second reel you know you can put that together in, in minutes so it's a it's a it's a inputs outputs thing again i think yeah definitely um, man. but it can get you in but you've got to then diversify and get yeah, it no. <laughs> oh, man. but um, yeah. mate it's been absolutely awesome to chat thanks very much for your time and obviously coming on mate it's been good to get to know you as well mate and just shoot the shit but um, just before we close things off, mate, where could everyone find you, Harry, if they have to want to find you on Instagram or anything like that at all? Yeah, so uh, really enjoyed this, by the way. Thank you for having me on. It's, uh, it's just Harry Shep Fitness everywhere. So TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube, I think. That's pretty much everything. Um, yeah, Harry Shep Fitness is, is, is everything. But, uh, awesome, mate. Yeah, Thanks very much. It.